Welcome back to Backstage 30. Well, from the Forks, we find ourselves at Nietzsche Commons. And once again, I'm my co-host, Jamie, and I'm, I laughed. I mean, we've done so many wonderful stories with Nietzsche Commons. Right now, though, how has Nietzsche Commons made an impact in this community, Jamie? Well, really, I mean, it's been amazing for the Point Douglas community where, where I actually live. Um, it's not only bolstered, you know, the, the community arts around here in terms of having their um, exhibitions and supporting local artists um, in making, uh, have a special niche for them to be able to sell their wares, um, but also because you can just buy rabbit and elk and uh, <laughs> wild blueberries and then enjoy, you know, sitting at the, the restaurant um, enjoying the free Wi-Fi and uh, all the goodies that they have there. Okay, so of course you are going to introduce us to some more artists. Yes, we'll be meeting Melissa Wastesakut and Becca Taylor. Okay, so let's talk about Melissa. What made it, I guess, an impression on you with Melissa? Well, I was just really impressed with the work that she's showing at Urban Shaman right now. Um, Melissa's uh, in a new Cree um, artist. Uh, she's a member of Pegwis First Nation in Manitoba. And she's been working around um, the Sasquatch or Sabe uh, character subject matter for a while. Um, she spoke on a panel at the WAG in 2009 about um, her perspectives on that. And so seeing her come out with a show uh, around it is is just really fresh and, and it's, it's really good to see. And Becca? And Becca, well, I'm wearing her earrings right now. So that and her necklace. So. Yes. Yeah, so she's a really inspiring uh, artist coming out with some really great design and artwork as well as uh, working in the arts community. Well, we can hardly wait to meet these fascinating young ladies. And then we will be talking to Arlie Ashcroft. She manages the Nietzsche Niche and find out more on the wonderful work that they're doing there. Now, we happen to visit at Urban Shaman Gallery with Melissa Wastesakud. This one is based on uh, Raphael's Madonna, the goldfinch. Pegwa's First Nation product, Melissa Wastesakud's art, focuses on a mysterious subject. Okimapu also known as the Sasquatch. When I was a lot younger, I think I was about two or three, there was this trailer for um, the legend of Sasquatch or the uh, legend, of, legend of Boggy Creek. They had shown that footage of the female Sasquatch going through the forest. It's really kind of grainy, but it's like the clearest footage, you know, out there pretty much. And that kind of always stuck with me because, well, I was scared. And then um, <clears throat> I started meeting other people that were interested. I think I really started when I was about 16, my dad started doing a lot of watercolors and I kind of took off with his watercolor set one day and just started fooling around with that. I just kind of started making art about it. Most of my characters, they seem pretty harmless, you know, they, there's a lot of humor to them and, you know, whereas people kind of look at them as, as monsters, uh, something to be feared. They are, you know, they're meant to be revered and honored. Um, they represent honesty. This is, um, Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam. And instead of Adam, Adam I put Okimapu here, touching the hand of God. And there's glitter like magic in the air. And it's kind of the creation of Okimapu. Um, well, for these pieces, you know, I'll just, I, I torn pages out of Bibles. I just ripped out the pages, with the religious imagery on it. And I'll just look at the images and kind of figure out, well, what would, Okimopu will be doing in this situation. I do a sketch. Uh, I'll copy it a few times. I might copy it digitally, print it out, uh, redo it. Then I'll, once I'm happy with how the figure looks, I'll start painting it. Like a flesh-eating monster and um, something to be feared. Like a, and also an omen of bad things to come. There's like so many different meanings, you know, throughout the world, you know, because we all, it seems like all cultures around the world have a version of Sasquatch. I see it in a different way just because, you know, people usually fear things that we don't understand or know about. So that's kind of why I put it out there in a humorous way. Putting a different face on a cryptic creature. For Go Winnipeg, I'm Kevin Hirschfield.
Yes, one of my favorite places here at the Nietzsche Commons is the Nietzsche Niche. And I have the lovely Arlie Ashcroft. And Arlie, there's so many things that I've been able to interview in as a singer and as an artist. But really, I mean, I want to say you're the heart and soul of the Nietzsche <laughs> Niche. So let's talk about this Nietzsche Niche and what it means to the community. Wow. Nietzsche Niche is, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's an art gallery and a shop. And what we do is we cater to Indigenous artists, specifically First Nation, Métis, Inuit, and those who live in the local community. Mm -hmm. So when you say it's the heart and soul, it is. But I am not the heart and soul. The artists are. Mm -hmm. Most definitely, and these are all artists that are within walking distance, if you Yeah, will. Yeah, right now we represent over 190 artists, oh. and I would say about 90% of them, maybe 85 to 90%, live within actual walking distance of the shop. Wow, so they can sell their, their arts here, and th they get the money, they get their commissions, mm -hmm. and you also, I guess, this is a great opportunity to expose their work to the rest of the city. So oh, yeah. you do have co-ops here now. We do. We started with, um, well, Nietzsche Commons, and Nietzsche Niche is a workers' co-op. And then we also have Northern Star Blanket Makers, which is a co-op as well. And we will be soon getting a women's fashion co-op of Indigenous fashion designers. Oh, wow. What fabulous news. Yeah. And, I mean, for you, though, the best part of your job here? It is probably, it's working with the artists. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we're one of the only places in the city where we sell the artwork, but we know the artists. We know them, we know their stories, we know the stories behind the work. So when people come in here, they're not just buying a piece of work or a piece of art, they're buying a story. And that's how we've always looked at it. Yeah. They're buying the history of that person, they're buying, um, they're supporting them economically. They're showing that artists can make a living as artists. And that's probably the best thing ever. It truly is. Well, continue on. You are doing so much in the community, and so is Nietzsche Commons. Don't go away now. You're going to meet one talented fashion designer, and her name is Becca Taylor. I'm Becca Taylor. I originated from Edmonton, that's where I grew up, but I've been here for about four years. Myself as an artist, I do a lot of beadwork. I do draw from a lot of uh, the traditions I grew up with as a Cree artist. I do try to use only natural materials um, or recycle everything. So my art practice does involve around a lot of the traditions of beading and community engagement. But my design practice has a lot to do with different techniques I've picked up throughout the years. Like I studied underneath a Japanese master dyer for a little bit of time. I've um, learned beading techniques from all around the world. So I just kind of draw on those inspirations from other artists and I just design clothing and jewelry. I guess I learned this when I was about six. I learned this technique from her. My mother, and she learned it from an elder that we used to spend time with when we were in Edmonton at the Friendship Center. Winnipeg is a very engaging community. Everybody wants to help you out. There's great mentorship programs here, and everybody's very, very supportive. It does take a little bit of time and a little, like a lot of hard work to really get your name known. But I feel like once you show that dedication and put that time and effort in, like it does start to take off at some point. It's been really rewarding, like meeting so many people, and I have a long ways to go yet. I guess I'll never stop learning or developing my art practice, but. Just a very exciting place to be right now. Well, Becca Taylor is certainly Winnipeg's treasure that we have stolen from Edmonton. And, oh, she's just an amazing artist, Jamie. She really is, yeah. And very, very sweet. Okay, so we're going to move on now. We happen to be standing in the literary section of the Nietzsche Niche. And you do have a writer in mind, don't you? Uh, David Robinson. He's uh, of Cree heritage, Manitoban, and um, he writes graphic novels and he's a writer and he's a longtime advocate for educating youth on, edu on Indigenous histories and contemporary issues. Wow, amazing. And then a photographer and then another multidisciplinary artist. Yes, we're going to be speaking with Scott Benesina-Bannon and Jamie Black. 
Interesting, okay, so I will be in conversation with David Robertson, but right now we go over to the platform gallery for Little Resistances and Scott Benicine Abandon. Show sort of looking at sort of the genesis of resistance. We are, we're all kind of aware of sort of the big monumental and historic um, things that get on TV and get mentioned in sort of the, the, the five o'clock news, like Burton Church and Oka and um, Idle No More. But uh, I'm really interested in not only those sort of monumental histories and uprisings and social unrest, but really looking at from a personal level. Um, where, where, those, where do those things originate from? And for myself as an artist, driven by sort of those political social concerns, I really thought it was, it was a good time to like sort of f focus on looking at myself individually, where those politics arise from. So this piece is a, a piece that is sort of, um, it's a kind of a, in, a, in Anishinaabe culture, there's uh, things called prayer flags, where they, they hang as offerings and sort of statements of uh, honoring for the, for our own gifts. So this is sort of like rooted in that kind of idea. But the words on it are um, actually uh, Subcommandant Marcos, it was, who was the leader or the face of the ELZN Zapatista movement for the last 20 years, um, has recently, recently released sort of his final statement as Subcommandant Marcos. And he basically declared that persona and that person dead um, and to be replaced by a different persona and a different um, person, and that's uh, Commandant Giliano, I believe. Uh, and, and that was very interesting to me in terms of recognizing where we are in terms of our struggles, like on a personal level, but also as, as, as communities and nations, and the need to not always take the same tact and reevaluate where we are. And um, for him, he realized that that persona from, 19, from the 90s was no longer needed. What was needed was a new sort of energy and a new voice. And so he took those, he took that and declared himself one, one of his personalities dead and to be born into a, a new sort of phase. So these are words sort of remediated, remediated um, from, from that last sort of speech that he released. And um, I, I played with it a little bit, but it, in the end, I, I just was really touched by sort of, sort of the relevancy ac across all indigenous struggles in, in the world and uh, this, the struggles of oppressed sort of communities. So and I use this as sort of a, centering point for the show. There's a huge influx of uh, indigenous, young indigenous artists coming up and it's really like the, the, the path of, the path of what, what that'll look like is going to be really self-directed and it's, just, it's kind of beautiful, you know, there's no sort of set course for any one artist and um, it's really just about building relationships and, and getting out there and experiencing new things and see where the practice goes. The Helen Betty Osborne story. David, your book your graphic novel, I guess you could call it. Why choose Betty? Well, for me, Betty's story is one which you can teach about a lot of different topics um, in learning about what happened to her. So it's not just about learning uh, what happened to Betty in her life and what she went through, but um, you can learn about the residential school system, missing and murdered ind Indigenous women, the justice system's treatment of Aboriginal people. So there's a wide range of things that you can bring into the classroom that teachers can teach from just that one graphic novel. You are a writer. This is David Robertson, the author of Betty. You know what? I guess what is the reaction from young people when they read a book like this? I mean, it's always good. Um, part of that reason is because the graphic novels are so popular with youth right now. Um, but the subject matter, too, uh, the, the graphic novel provides it with an avenue um, to bring into the classroom in a way that excites kids, that they can engage with, and that they retain more information with. So when I have the opportunity to go to classrooms and talk to them directly, um, I'm always amazed with how much they've retained and how much they've learned and all the questions they have. And it's, it's, it's always positive. Like, I haven't received a negative reaction yet, which is, which is, which is uh, surprising but, uh, but amazing. Uh, and so that's the kind of things that we need to be doing, uh, bringing youth uh, history and truths in ways that they can understand and relate to and retain and share. Do you sometimes think it starts with adults, it starts with parents and you know maybe the conversation needs to begin between parents and their children about things like this? Definitely. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the impetus to, for change needs to come from the adults because that's who um, are responsible for our youth 
But on the same side, the youth are responsible for our future. Mm -hmm. So adults streaming that information through to the youth, and then the youth bring that information and share it. Because uh, that's, I mean, that's how negativity is, is shared when we don't provide the information. So we need to provide the information, positivity is shared, and then we see change. Have we changed? Have we learned from any of this? I mean, we're still, we're still in a difficult spot right now. I think, I think now is the time where you see that there's a relationship here in Canada that's broken. Uh, it's not just um, the indigenous, indigenous people that need to change. It's not just uh, non-indigenous people. It's together through a dialogue, through information sharing, and that change occurs. Uh, and so I think now is the time to do it. It's the right time uh, with all the information that's happening through the TRC, uh, the residential schools, um, and through the epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women, I think we're at a breaking point, and we can go. We can go one of two ways. I think we need to go the positive way, and it takes everybody to do that. Wow, people like you, David, though, spreading the word and making making a difference. Now we're going to meet a multidisciplinary artist, Jamie Black, who is giving voice to those missing and murdered women. It um, calls community donations of empty red dresses to mark the absence of missing and murdered Indigenous women across Canada. What I do is I try, I've been traveling around putting up the empty red dresses and art installations um, in order to get people thinking and talking about the issue and also getting communities all across Canada, um, you know, to kind of start uh, becoming more cohesive and understanding from both sides what's happening and just build solidarity and, and action around the issue. I think that visual art has kind of a symbolic power that allows people to um, enter into a conversation and, and they can no longer put up barriers with, you know, um, print information and different information, we often can put up barriers to that, but when you see a visual image, it impacts you emotionally first, and, and you're interested and you want to know why it's there, and so artwork has the capacity to um, allow people to feel emotionally connected to what's going on before they find out even the particulars of what's happening. The interesting thing about the installation is I've been doing a lot of shows mostly not in galleries but in public spaces. If you put it in a public space the work kind of, it asks people a question. They want to know, they're, they're struck by it and they want to know why, why those dresses are there. So um, part of the way the art works is that it draws in everybody um, and it, like, it doesn't put up barriers, it, it kind of it welcomes people in and, um, and invites them to ask questions. I just felt like after going to a lot of marches, you know, not a lot of people show up sometimes, sometimes people can't for whatever reasons, and um, there's a, there's a kind of a, there's a resistance to protesters in kind of the larger public, and so um, I felt like artwork might be a way to draw people in that, that a protest um, or a march might not be able to. To me, red's a really powerful kind of sacred color. I was never really, um, I was never really taught any spiritual indigenous ways, but I always have been drawn to the color red, and I've always used it for kind of sacred purposes in my own kind of spiritual practice. And I'm, now that I've been doing this work, I've realized that there are many cultures that hold um, the color red as being very sacred and powerful, and seeing nothing in it is a is a stark reminder that someone's not there. Welcome back. Once again, we're here at Nietzsche Commons. And Jamie, I just have to say, the Red Dress campaign by Jamie Black really has made such a powerful statement. 
It certainly has, and she's been working on that for a while. It's been traveling uh, across Canada. And, you know, Jamie's a, a, a Métis multidisciplinary artist um, whose work not only focuses on, you know, the red dress, but also in other areas of social justice issues. And certainly um, the red dress project is really important because it, it, it brings about the issue of, of missing and murdered um, Aboriginal women across Canada. And that's really important because there are 12 or more than 1,200 uh, missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls um, reported for the last 30 years. So um, that, that doesn't need to happen anymore and, and we need to talk about it more. Most definitely. And to start the conversation too, Scott's exhibition Little Resistances certainly does that as well. Yes, Scott is a Anishinaabe intermedia artist. Um, he's, he works in photography, um, video, audio, and printmaking. And uh, he's been in international um, residencies, exhibitions, and, and collaborations. Um, and the work at Platform uh, is beautifully installed. Mm -hmm. And it focuses, um, investigates, and conflates, really, um, both personal and historic um, huge resistances and acts of res resistances. Um, and I think it's very significant and empowering because it not only talks about familial stories, but it also um, talks about those historical um, Indigenous struggles. Oh, wow. I mean, and it's, it's so nice. I mean, these are Winnipeggers that are really making an impact and, and spreading the word, not only here locally, but internationally. So my only question to you is, where to next? So we are going to the uh, Indigenous Library Education Centre, uh, and it's, it's a good place. So we'll, we'll check it out, I guess. Okay, that'll be right after the break. Okay.